Happy Sabbath. I think, uh, you know, I've sang that song so many times that uh, it's automatic for me to pick those songs when I, ask, when I speak, where I speak. And for some reason this morning, when I sang the song, I started to cry. You know why? I'll tell you why. Because we're serving a God that's almighty. And it says, early in the morning, our, our song shall rise to thee. Holy, holy, holy. Do you realize who are, we are worshiping this morning? We are worshiping a merciful God, a mighty God. Our, our puny brains cannot fully grasp who God really is. He gives us His Word, and in His Word is power. And it says, God over all who rules eternity. It brought tears in my eyes, and that's why I had to get this Kleenex and wipe my, my nose is pretty plugged up right now. But I thank God that He's given me this opportunity to come and worship with like-minded believers. Amen? Amen. And uh, my regards from my wife to the church. Uh, one day I'll, I'll be able to bring her out to Washington State. And you know, I, uh, I was here last weekend. I flew back to California in, on Monday or Sunday. And uh, my wife said, why don't you just stay there the whole week? I said, honey, I got to work. <laughs> uh, for those of that don't know, I work for Loma Linda University. And I'm in the, the engineering department of campus engineering. And I, uh, my work is uh, servicing air conditioning units. And God can use just about anybody, can he? Yeah, and... Uh, little history about myself. I was born and raised in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I was raised by parents that raised me the best way they knew how. Very strict. And as I got older, old enough to do what I wanted to do, I decided to walk away from the church. And praise God, he didn't give up on me. All those years, my father would pray for me because I was the black sheep. I went to the Adventist curriculum, I went through all the schools, and I left the church, but my father kept praying for me. And my father was able to see uh, a conversion in me before he died. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. And I remember distinctly him telling me that he wanted to see me again. And all I have to do is just trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean not in my own understanding. But in all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Amen. This morning we looked at Christ as our only Savior. He's our only Savior. We have to trust him that he will give us the victory over all besetments. Whatever it might be that is in separation from you and Christ, he can give us the victory to overcome it. And so this morning, I, as I, we continue to study the word of God, we're going to look in, in, in a... In this context, in Matthew chapter 5, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to our scripture this morning. Matthew chapter 5. And you know, finishing up what I was saying about how God called me out of darkness, my father was praying for me. And, you know, the Bible says, train up a child when they're when? When they're little, right? In Proverbs 22. Six, it says, train up a child when they're young. When they get old, they'll never depart from it. And I'm a true testament of that text, that God called me back into his marvelous light. And, you know, since I've surrendered my life to him back in 2000, you know, it's been a battle every day. It's a warfare that we have to struggle. But God said he'll give us the victory. Amen. And I've experienced it for myself, how I've had victory over things that I was holding on to and that I could see that he worked with me. And you, most of you, all of you can, can, exp uh, can testify to that, how God has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, giving me the victories every time. When, the, when I met the, the situation, he brought it to view, he brought it to light, and he says, go make it right. Go make it right. And I know God was, is still working in me because he gives me that power to have that victory. Amen? Have that victory. And so this morning we're going to look at this 
little light of mine. You know that song that we grew up with? <laughs> we used to sing it in Sabbath school, in cradle roll. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. You know, not knowing that that song really has a deep, deep application for all of us today. This little light of ours. Let's look at it in Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 14. Ye are the light of the world. Ye are the, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Ellen White calls the house the world. Not just your house, not in this, just in this church, but the whole world. This light has to shine throughout the world. Wherever you go, this light has to shine. Verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Amen. With just an added word of prayer, you just bow your heads as I seek the Lord in prayer this morning. Father God, I pray, Lord, that I'm a man of unclean lips. As Isaiah said, woe is me. Father, I pray that you give me, me an appointed time to speak your word. I pray, Father, that the words that I speak will come directly from your throne of, in heaven, that the people may hear and have an open heart, that they may be receptive to this truth. Thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. A city is set on a hill cannot be hid. The city represents habitations of people. The world is inhabited by people. But not only does the city represent where people are inhabited, it is also considered a place where we dwell. Also, a hill is something that is formed like a mountain, but it's not actually a mountain, but it is a hill. It is an environment where we can go out and share this light. And the scripture tells us, let this light so shine, but it also giveth light unto all that are in the house. This morning, we're going to look at this light. Not the way we thought it would be, but the way we're going to look at it from the pen of inspiration. This light. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Turn with me to John. Let's go to John. We're doing a Bible study this morning. It's something that you have been doing, but we're just reviewing, and it's important to review. You know why we need to review? Because we forget. I've heard many people say, I've read Steps to Christ. I said, really? Well, what does this chapter say? Uh, chapter 2? remember because we forget and you know what the Lord had led me to he led me back to steps to Christ and it is such a beautiful book I'm sure all of you have read it but my steps to Christ is a red leather hardback and in it it's underscored underlined and as I pulled out the steps to Christ again for some reason the, the Lord led me back to steps to Christ and as I started to read I said how come I never underlined this this segment I missed it. But God showed it me the whole, through the Holy Spirit. I need to read that again. I said, man, I didn't underscore it. So I got my pen and I started to underline it. And it brought a different meaning than I, than I ever thought it was. So we're going to review this morning on this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Let's look at it. John chapter 8, 8 verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the what? The light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but ha shall have the light of life. So Jesus is saying here that he is the light of the world. 
This morning we looked at our Sabbath school that Jesus is the only Savior. Amen. Right? We saw it for ourselves. Jesus is the one that will save us. And in verse 12 here, he's saying, I am the light of this world. Turn with me to John. John chapter 1. We're there at John already. Let's, let's confirm this. John chapter 1, starting at verse 4. John chapter 1, verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shined in darkness, and the darkness, what? comprehended it not. Isn't it any wonder that leadership back in Christ's time did not comprehend who Jesus was? Yeah, that's interesting. That darkness doesn't comprehend light. In the Mount of Blessing, and you know what? How many of you have this book? The thoughts of the Mount of Blessing. Christ also, the, through the Holy Spirit, led me back to this book. Underscored it, underlined I started to memorize paragraphs. And it's been such a blessing. Just as the, the title says, it, the, thought of, the, thought, the Mount of Blessing, it, it has been a blessing to me. Such a powerful book in my spiritual walk with Christ. Mount of Blessing, page 64 says, No other light ever has shown or ever will shine upon fallen men save that which emanates from Christ. Christ is the light of the world, right? And Ellen White is telling us no other light has ever shown or ever will shine upon fallen men save that which emanates from Christ. So Christ was emanating light. We're going to look at this light. He was emanating The Savior is the only light that can illuminate the darkness of a world lying in sin. I didn't think you got that. Let me read that again. The Savior is the only light that can illuminate the darkness of a world lying in sin. So if Christ is dwelling in the heart... It is impossible to conceal the light of his presence. Amen. If, Ellen White says, if he's dwelling in your heart. It is impossible to conceal the light of his presence. And she also says, if you don't have light to give, it is because the vital power has left them. You are the light of the world. She says that. Let me read it to you. It's not my words. It is her words. She says, If Christ is dwelling in the heart, it is impossible to conceal the light of his presence if those who profess to be followers of Christ are not the light of the world, it is because the vital power has left them. Amen. Could it be that we are in the church not emanating this light? She says this also, if they have no light to give, it is because there's no connection with Christ. Christ is the only Savior. Are you connected to Christ this morning? No hands. No hands. I'm speaking to myself too. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Turn with me to, we're here, John, John chapter 1. Look at verse 9. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Can you imagine? Our Savior, our King of kings, Lord of Lord, created this whole world, and nobody knew it.
Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians. We're looking at this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting at verse 6. Six. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of who? Jesus Christ. Christ's followers are to be more than a light in the midst of men. Ellen White tells us that in Mount of Blessing. You see, my friends, my words are inadequate. I have to read inspiration to get the full impact of the Word of God. Amen? She says this, Christ's followers are to be more than a light in the midst of men. They are the light of the world. Jesus says to all who have named his name. Now, I'm sure all of us here have named the name of Christ in our lives. Amen? Amen. You have given yourself to me and I have given you to the world as a representative. Are you a representative of Christ this morning? No hands. I have to ask myself every day, Lord, am I representing you? As the Father has sent him into the world, he, so he declares, have I sent them? That's us. He sent us into the world. This house, in chapters, Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, it says, this house, this house is the world. In Deer Park, Springdale. Uh, where else? <laughs> Kettle Falls, Colville. Uh, any, any further? <laughs> I'm talking about this part of the country of Washington State. You, have, you, are, you and I are representatives here. Don't forget that. As Christ in the, is the channel for the revelation of the Father, so we are to be channel for the revelation of Christ. Are you a, rev, are you a representative this morning to Christ, as Christ? She says this, page 66, Mount of Blessings. The church of Christ Every individual disciple of the Master is heaven, listen, is heaven's appointed channel for the revelation of God to men. So no one here is exempted this morning. It's not just for the pastor. It's not just for Pastor Al to do the work. All of us here has been appointed. Whether you like it or not, you and I are appointed She says, angels of glory wait to communicate through you. Uh-oh. Wow. Angels are waiting. Waiting for us to communicate to someone that's outside there. We have to have this mindset. And that's why it's important to have your ammo in your car, right? You know what I'm talking about? The books, the literature. You got to have it in your car. Because when you pray in the morning, you say, Lord, show me. You lead me to someone today. You better have your ammo. Because when you ask for that prayer, be ready. God's going to lead you to someone at Walmart. In the line at Walmart, the gas station, an opportunity arises. You are a representative of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Shall human agent fail of accomplishing his work, his appointed work, all oh, then to that degree, the world is robbed of the promised influence of the Holy Spirit. We have a great responsibility this morning to let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Turn with me to John. Let's go. John chapter 17. John chapter 17. We're already here at Matthew, or John, let's go, John 17. John 17, are you there? John 17, verse 18. John 17, 18. As thou hast sent me into the world, 
so even so have I also sent them into the world. You know, God has given us a command this morning. He's commanded us. It, it is a direct order. And what happens if you're in the military and your commanding officer gives you a direct order and you disobey? What happens to you? That's the military. Now, I've never been in the military, so I don't know. That's why I had to ask you. So if you're court-martialed, what do you think happens to you if you disobey God's direct command? Well, we read the text this morning, right? It is because of His mercies we are not consumed. Because great, His compassions fail not, great is His faithfulness. They're renewed every morning. So every morning as you come boldly to the throne of grace, you ask the Lord, Lord, help me. You plead with God. You plead with God. Lord, place it in my heart that I may be a representative. When was the last time we prayed that prayer? When was it? We need to be praying that prayer. You know what? You do, we don't want to ask that prayer because that prayer requires surrender. Surrender from what we want to do. It requires sacrifice. I had to learn that the hard way. I didn't want to sacrifice. I didn't want to surrender. I wanted to do it my way. And as we saw this morning, God has an appointed way. His way. But we always want to do it our way. The Bible is telling us in John chapter 17, verse 18, As thou hast sent me into the world, so even so have I also sent them into the world. Verse 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. My friends, we need to be sanctified. We are need to be made holy. And that's why when I, we sang that song, Holy, 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 it affected me because I need to come boldly to the throne of grace in holiness. Do you realize in Desire of Ages, uh, uh, we say Happy Sabbath. You know, we meet brethren, Happy Sabbath, Happy Sabbath. And we keep the Sabbath on a 24-hour basis, which is required according to the Ten Commandments. Amen. But do you realize in 83, page 83 in the Desire of Ages, she says, in order for us to keep the Sabbath day holy, you actually have to be so holy the rest of the week. So it doesn't just start on Sabbath. It starts every day of your life. Holiness. What makes you think you can come to church and turn a light switch off, light switch and say, I'll be holy for 24 hours today? That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. Sanctify them to thy truth. Thy word is truth. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians. Let's go. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Are you there? I'm not there yet. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're looking at this little light of mine. I am going to let it shine. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, start, look at verse 2. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. You know what? That's another command. To be sanctified and to be called saints. I'm not talking about the New Orleans saints. I'm talking about saints of God. What is a saint? Tell me. Huh? What is a saint? Come on. Talk to me. Somebody that is holy. Isn't it? We are called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So we are to be sanctified, but not be sanctified only, but to be called saints. Are you and I a representative of Christ this morning? 
If Christ is dwelling in the heart, it is impossible to conceal the light of His presence. Turn with me to Philippians. Turn with me there. Let's look at it. We're doing a Bible study on this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Philippians chapter 2, verse 15. That ye may be blameless. Uh oh. What does that word blameless mean? Without fault. And harmless. Are you harmless? When somebody comes to you with false doctrine, do you, are you harmless? Or do you get defensive? And argumentative? And do you come with the spirit of love? You know, Ellen White tells us in The Desire of Ages, Christ never parleyed with controversy. He always spoke in love. And we, as God's people, are to be blameless, harmless, that the sons of God, what does it say? The sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shines as light in the world. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Look, at, look in Psalms 97. Turn with me to Psalms 97. We're just reviewing this morning. Sometimes we forget and we need to be addressed and reminded that we need to let our light so shine before men. Psalms 97 verse 11. Light is sown for the righteous and the gladness for the upright in heart. Is light shining? It's light shining for the righteous this morning. Look at Psalms 112. Let's turn there. I'm setting the foundation of our study. And this little light of mine. Psalms 112. Look at verse 4. Unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. Are you upright this morning? You know that word uprightness means right doing. Right doing when no one's watching. You there at Psalms 112? Let's go to Psalms 119, 130. Psalms 119, 130. Psalms 119, 130. The entrance of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. Are you studying the Word of God? Are you reading His Word every day? Not just once a week, but every day as you come boldly to the throne of grace. Are you studying this light? Because the Bible is telling us in Psalms 130, the entrance of thy Word giveth light. It giveth understanding even unto the simple. In the Desire of Ages, you know, this is my favorite book. Well, actually... One of my favorite books. I'm sure many of you have your favorite books. But the one that the Lord has led me to in the recent months is The Desire of Ages, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, and Steps to Christ. I cannot get enough of it. I have to read it more and more. How about you? <laughs> And this is found in The Desire of Ages, page 464. In the manifestation of God to his people, light had ever been a symbol of his presence. I'm going to read this slowly so that you can understand what I'm trying to read here. What I'm trying to convey. In the manifestation of God to his people, light had ever been a symbol of his presence. At the creative word in the beginning, light had shone out of darkness. 
light traveling at 186,000 miles per second. He said, let there be light and light traveling at that speed. You know, man tried to measure God's word, but it's just a guesstimate, a guesstimation. For he spoke, for he spake and it was done and he commanded and it stood fast. The heavens declare the glory of God and light at his creative word had shone out of darkness. Light had been enshrouded in the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, leading the vast armies of Israel. Light blazed with awful grandeur about the Lord on, the Mount, on Mount Sinai. Light rested over the mercy seat in the tabernacle. Light filled the temple of Solomon at its dedication. Light shone on the hills of Bethlehem when the angels brought the message of redemption on the watching shepherds. You know that text that comes into mind is in Luke chapter 2 where the angels brought good tidings of great joy which will be to all men. You know that great tiding of great joy, the tidings of great joy, was Christ coming to this world. We cannot fully understand that. The angels in the whole universe don't even understand it. In fact, in fact Ellen White tells us uh, uh, that it is the science of angels to learn of the plan of redemption. Our puny brains cannot even grasp the enormity and the power that God has displayed in Christ coming to this world. If we fully understand what that meant to you and me, we would live our lives so differently. We would. We would live our lives so differently. Because God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness is a command to each of us this morning. I wasn't finished with that quotation. 464, Desire of Ages. God is light. And in the words, I am the light of the world, Christ declared his oneness with God and his relation to the whole human family. It was he who at the beginning had caused the light to shine out of darkness. And this world is dark. Look around you. Look at the news. Look at what's going on in our world. It's darkness. And so how do we show this light? How are we to let our light so shine? How is it? How do we do it? Ellen White tells us in 307, The Desire of Ages. She says, True character is not shaped from without and put on. It radiates from within. Let me say that again. True character, because there is a false character. There's true and there's false, isn't it? Is it? Is that right? True character is not shaped from without and put on. It radiates from within. If we wish to direct others in the path of righteousness, and by the way, righteousness, according to Psalms 119, 172, righteousness is the law of God. Okay? So if we wish to direct others in the path of righteousness, the true principles of righteousness must be enshrined in our own hearts. The law of God must be enshrined in our own hearts. We may proclaim the theory of religion, but it is practical piety. What does that word piety mean? It means devotion, to his, uh, devotion to his will and obedience to his service. That's what it means. So God has commanded us to be what? Representatives of his light. So we have to be obedient to his will and devoted to his service. So if we proclaim the theory of religion, it is practical piety that holds forth the word of truth. The consistent life. Number one. The holy conversation the 
unswerving integrity. The active benevolent spirit and the godly example, these are the mediums, one, two, three, four, five, these are the mediums through which light is conveyed to the world. The consistent life, the holy conversation, the unswerving integrity, the active benevolent spirit, and the godly example. We're going to look at these five points this morning. Because if I'm to let my light so shine before men that they may see my good works and glorify my Father which is in heaven, I need to be consistent. Is your life consistent when no one's watching? I swim during my lunch break at Loma Linda University. And I swim at approximately 11.30 in the morning. Because that's when my lunch starts. Consistent. Monday to Thursday. Get in the pool at a certain time. It takes me about five minutes from my shop to the pool. Get into the pool. I swim 500 yards. I'm done. Get out. Go back. Eat my lunch. I have an hour lunch at work. One day, two weeks ago, this is an object lesson. It was an object lesson for me. And I'm sharing it with you this morning. A contractor is working on one of the compressors at one of our buildings. And I forgot to tell him that 11.30 was my lunch. He came at 11.15. So I was worried that I was going to miss, miss my swimming. You know, it's like, almost like a drug. Yeah. Like, I got to do this. You know, it's like the endorphins need to kick in. I get a high off those endorphins. So, I, yeah, you know, when I swim, I just, I don't know. Is that crazy? No. no. Okay, anyway. <laughs> so this contractor came in, and uh, I was looking at my clock, and I'm like, uh, I got to go, I got to go. And he went over my lunch break to about 11.40, and I said, man, I got to go. We, 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 we got to finish this later. He said, okay, go ahead, meet me later. So I rushed back to my shop, got my swimming gear, and started going to the gym to go swim. And when I got to the entrance of the gym, one of the swimmers that I swim with came out and says, you're late. I said, late? Yeah, I'm late. But I, you know, I didn't think they, they didn't notice. So I, I walk in and I get to the locker room. And as I get into the locker room, I'm changing my clothes. Another swimmer comes and he goes, you're late. thought about that. I said, man, they're, they're taking notice. They're, saying, they're telling me I was late. Yes, I was late, but nevertheless, I'm here. Better late than never, I was thinking. But I saw the object lesson. So I thought about it. I said, okay. I, I, you know, I didn't need to explain it. So I got my swimwear and I went right to the edge of the pool to get in. And another swimmer came swimming and he looked up. He said, you're late! And I looked at it from a spiritual point. I'm usually consistent on my time. And people notice that. When I was late swimming, they took notice and said, you were late. Is my life and your life consistent? Just when you think nobody notices, they know exactly what you've been doing or what you have been doing. Consistency. Is your life consistent? How am I to let my light so shine if my life is inconsistent? Consistent. These are the mediums through which light is conveyed to the world. The consistent life. The holy conversation, number two. Is your conversation holy? Turn with me to Philippians. Let's go there. Philippians. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Look at verse 27. Luke, uh, Philippians chapter 1 verse 27 says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Our conversation should be to what? It should be to the gospel of Jesus Christ, as it says here. 
It becometh the gospel of Christ. Is our conversation holy? Well, let's confirm that even more. Go to uh, 2 Peter. 2 Peter. You're there at Colossians. Let's go. Revelation. 2 Peter. Chapter 3. Verse 11. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11, saying, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? The Bible didn't say some, in some holy, in all holy conversation. What are you talking about with your neighbor? What are you talking about with your family members? What are you talking about to your friends? What is our conversation? Is it about our vacation to Hawaii? Is it our houses, our cars, our money? Whatever it might be, what is our conversation about? Because the Bible is telling us our conversation should become the gospel. The consistent life. The holy conversation. These are the mediums through which light is conveyed to the world. Number three. Unswerving integrity. You know, I looked up that word in, twer- in uh, integrity. The Webster's Dictionary says, not deviating from any rule or standard. Not wandering from any law. Unswerving. Integrity means unimpaired state of anything, particularly of the mind, moral soundness. You have unswerving integrity? Our church there in Colton invites guests to come and speak at our churches. And we usually house them at Loma Linda University at the foundation department. The the foundation department has guest rooms. And one in particular is called the uh, Ritchie Mansion. uh, Next time you'll be able to stay there, the reason for that is because uh, um, those weren't available at the time you guys came, but I'm going to get it set up next time you come and visit us. But this Ritchie Mansion is a very plush. And so we invite these guests and they stay there. And so the church uh, had me set it all up because I know the, per- the people that work at the foundation department. And so I, I asked and inquired uh, foundation, I-, I need a room for such and such time and for this amount. And <clears throat> they said, okay, no problem. So the time came, the church gave me the money to pay for the, the, the accommodations. And so I went to the foundation department and the, the department, uh, my fr- her, her, Doris, her, her name is Doris. She's really good friends of mine. She said, Eddie, you've been so good to me, uh, good to us. You're going to get it for free. Oh, really? Really? Yeah, free. Oh, nice. But now I have some money in my pocket. Now listen, the devil's smart. He knows how to tempt each of us. Right. He's got a snare for each of us. <coughs> and so here I was thinking, okay, I did all this work, and now I have this money, and uh, I'm going to pay for the room, but now they're saying it's free. The devil said, hey, you, you work hard for this. Listen, you think I'm exempted for this, from this temptation? None of us are exempted. So he put this in my mind. I'm like, ah, I know exactly what to do with this. But for three days, I held on to that money. No one knew except me and the universe. You're probably thinking, oh, Eddie, you know what was right to do, Right? 
For three days, I struggled. I prayed, Lord, what am I doing? This belongs to the church. Give it back. I, 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 I couldn't imagine even entertaining the thought. Praise God, I gave it back. Amen? Amen. No questions asked. What, what, what in the world? Thursday, at the shop, I went to the vending machine in our department, and I'm looking for a granola bar. 35 cents, granola bar. I put the 35 cents in, pull it, boom, 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 two came out. All right, two for the price of one. <laughs> so I grab these two granola bars, and I'm walking to the shop, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. I got to pay another 35 cents, but I didn't have it. I had to go back to the shop. And you know what the devil said? Oh, you deserve it. <laughs> two for the price of one. You're the lucky guy. Nobody knew. No one knew. No one knew but the whole universe. Unswerving integrity. These are the mediums through which light is conveyed to the world. The consistent life. The holy conversation. The unswerving integrity. Number four is the active benevolent spirit. What is this active benevolent spirit? Having a disposition to do good, possessing love, Love to mankind. A desire to promote their prosperity and happiness. That means to desire to promote for them, not for us. We have a tendency to, to be benevolent among ourselves. The active benevolent spirit. Turn with me to Matthew. Matthew. I think I share this with you folks. Some of you never heard this one yet. My father was in a, in a facility before he passed away. He was in there for six months. You know, and our the culture that we, we come from, you know, we don't put our parents in, in, in a facility. But my mom couldn't, couldn't take care of him. All of us worked. So it was very hard for her to, to even take care of him. My father was bedridden and was in total care. One Sunday morning, I went to see him, and I pulled him out from the facility, and I wanted him to see the sunshine because he's been inside that facility you know, for I don't know how long, long time. So I took him out, and I started to sing songs to him. And... <clears throat> I said, Dad, look how beautiful today is, you know. And then all of a sudden, two people, a husband and a wife, was coming, and, you know, and I knew they weren't Seventh-day Adventists because they, didn't, they had all this jewelry on them, lipstick and makeup. And, so you know they weren't Adventists. But today, sometimes you wonder, you know. But in this particular case, I was prejudiced because... They were an Adventist. And so they came and they said, Hi, Felix, how are you? Who are these people? They know my father's name. Felix, we've been praying for you. I said, Oh, they've been praying for my dad. By the way, I'm, I'm so-and-so. This is my husband, so-and-so. I said, Oh, nice, nice to meet you. I'm the son. Okay, nice. Nice to meet you. Can we pray for Felix? I said, Sure. So they started to pray. As they started to pray, I, I started to cry. I said, this, their prayer was so powerful. I was like, 
who are these people? They, they made me cry. And then the husband decides to pray. And, and when he started to pray, I absolutely cried. I was like, these people were sincere. They were an Adventist. They said, oh, yeah, we come, we come out every Sunday and we pray for everybody in the facility. <gasps> I was rebuked right at that point. I said, I don't even do that. Let alone visit someone. When was the last time I visited someone? Well, my dad don't count. My dad don't count. Oh, well, yeah, we pray for everyone in this facility. I said, oh, my gosh. Holy Spirit, prick my heart. You know, when Jesus condemned the leadership of the church, he condemned them by saying, let's look at it. Woe unto you. Matthew 23, 23. They're in Matthew. Just turn one page over. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise, cummins, and have omitted the weightier matters. Of the law. Judgment, mercy, and faith. These are ye have to done, he have done, and not to leave the other undone. He rebuked leadership. He rebuked that group of people saying, You disregarded the weightier matters. Turn with me to Matthew. You're there in Matthew. Go to Matthew 25. We're looking at this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Verse 34, Matthew 25, 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. You gave me drink. I was stranger and you took me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered and fed thee? Or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in? Or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick? Or in prison and came unto thee, and the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto the one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. The active, benevolent spirit. Verse 42 For I was hungered, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you took me not in. Naked and you clothed me not. Sick and in prison and you visited me not. Then shall they all answer. Then shall they also answer him saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered and thirst or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison? And did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer unto them. Answer them saying, Verily, I say unto you, Inasmuch as he did it not to the least of these, you did it not to me. This is a serious one. The weightier manners matters for a Christian we cannot neglect. These are the mediums through which light is conveyed to the world. The active, benevolent spirit. Are we active in benevolence? Are we too busy to spend the time in, engaged in action? We're too busy. I'll have time to go pray for people in a facility. I don't have time to visit someone in prison. Although someone is writing to me from, from Cochrane prison, wanting me to come out to, to visit. I don't know where Cochrane is, somewhere up north or south from you guys up in San Francisco area. Or I don't know where that is. I looked it up in the map, I remember. It's somewhere below Sacramento. The 
The weightier matters. Have we neglected the weightier matters? This is serious. If we are to let our light so shine before men, if Christ is dwelling in the heart, it is impossible to conceal the light of His presence. Number four, the active benevolent spirit. Number five, the godly example. The godly example. I don't know if I told you folks this story. I might have, I, I don't remember. I was working on the, the dental school one day, and it was hot. It was last year, as a matter of fact. And I needed to get some, some parts for a unit. And I, and I rushed down, I rushed down to the shop. Our, our, we have a country store where we keep all our parts for the, for the university. And I rushed to the store, and the guy who, who runs the store was, was talking to two other guys. And I came in and I was in a hurry. I said, ding dong, there's a, there's a, there's a, a button that calls you know, for, the, for the attention of the storekeeper. But he was right there on the counter. And I rang the doorbell. He goes, I ran it twice. Ding dong, ding dong. <laughs> talking to the two, two guys, not paying attention to me. And I rang the bell again. Ding dong! And he said, you know what I do with guys like you that can't wait? I ignore them. Now, I wasn't in the mood to hear that. I was in a hurry. I wanted to get this job done. And I didn't want to hear that from him. And I was like, my blood pressure went up. I was already hot from coming off the roof. And now I got to hear this from this guy. And I, I wasn't going to put up with that. And I, I, I walked away and I went around and I got into the store from the back door. The other guy that works back there, he let me in. And I went and got the stuff. Now I know the guy knew I was upset because I, I didn't talk to him anymore. But before I, I did that, I said something to him that I regretted. I called him a name or something, I forget. I don't want to say that, but... I called him something, and I left, and I went around, got my stuff. And those three guys heard me, him and the two other guys. So I got my stuff, and he knew I was upset, and he wanted to just do it a little bit more, you know, kind of egging me on. And so I just kept my mouth shut because I knew if I said something, I would, I would have really exploded. But I got my stuff. I left the room, went to my, my job, got on the roof. And the Holy Spirit pricked my heart. And I said, I failed again, Lord. I got on my knees again and I prayed. I said, Lord, I, I, I failed again. What is happening with me? Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me. Got my job done. Now the Holy Spirit said, go back. And confess. So I drive back to the shop, drive back to the shop, and uh, there he was. The other two guys were gone. And I went to John, and I said, John, I am so sorry how I reacted. He said to me, I won't forget this. He said, how long have I known you? You know me. Why did you act like that? I said, Lord, I said, I am truly sorry. Will you forgive me? He said, yeah. See, here is a man, born and raised Adventist also, backslidden, been watching me. But that, was, that didn't end there. I had to go make right with the other two guys because when I went up to them, one of them said to me, you? He said, I, I couldn't believe you acted like that. Will you forgive me? He said, yeah, I forgive you. I'm sorry. And the third guy, 
was my brother. <laughs> I waited for that last one. My brother goes, what happened to you? I said, I lost it. I lost it. Will you forgive me? He said, yeah. The godly example. Do we have those traits? These are the medium through which light is conveyed to the world. The consistent life. The holy conversation. The unswerving integrity. The active benevolent spirit. The godly example. We can profess all we want, as Ellen White says, in Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. She says that. I read it to you already. I want to read it again. If those who profess to be followers of Christ are not the light of the world, it is because the vital power has left them. Have you ever wonder? You go to church and you start talking to someone about some doctrine or some, something and they don't agree with you? And you know from the Bible it is the truth? And you wonder, what, what in the world? Like one of my pastors at my conference church. One day he came knocking without calling me. Just came over my house. Oh, come on in, Pastor. He knew that I was going to a self-supporting church. I was juggling my, my attendance from the conference church to a, to a self-supporting church, and he wanted to see what really was my intentions. I have no intentions. I just want to follow the truth. How about you? I want to follow the truth. I so, you know... I had a book. I know he was using the New King James Version. If you do a study on that, you know which Bible you should be using. So I gave him this, this little booklet on exposing the New King James. I said, Pastor, I got this little book. Tell me what you think. I want you to read it. Because I knew he was using that version. And you know what happened? He never responded to, to my, my, my book. I don't know if he read it or not. Every time I see him, he never talks to me about it. In fact, he avoids me. <laughs> anyway, that's not the point. My point is, if those who profess to be followers of Christ are not the light of the world, it is because the vital power has left them. Could it be could it be? And I'm not here to condemn anyone. That's not my position. My position is, you wonder why they don't see the truth of light? It is maybe because the vital power has left them? Could it be? They don't obey the law of God. As it is said, obedience is the test of discipleship. It is the keeping of the commandments that proves our sincerity of our profession of love when the doctrines we accept kills sin in the heart. You see, sometimes people bring in these things, these suppositions, they push their suppositions, but they never want to talk about sin. When the doctrines we accept kills sin in the heart. Our study this morning on Christ is the only Savior God's appointed way is to what? Repent. Turn away from that sin. The doctrines we accept kill sin in the heart, purifies the soul from defilement, and bears fruit unto holiness. We may know it is the truth of God. Amen? Amen. That's the standard of doctrines being brought into the church. Most of these guys don't want to talk about sin. They don't. They only want to talk about their, their doctrine. They believe their doctrine is right. If you don't believe what I believe, you're going to be lost. She says, when benevolence, kindness, 
tenderheartedness, sympathy are manifested in the lives, when the joy of right doing is in the heart, when we exalt Christ and not self, we may know that our faith is of the right order. I love that. You're not here by chance. You know that when you follow the word of God and true inspiration, you know your faith is of the right order. These are the mediums through which light is conveyed to the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. I brought this book, Christ's Object Lesson. You guys got this book? <laughs> I love this book too. How about you? I want to close with this statement. This is found in 236. 236. And the chapters go into the highways and hedges. Jesus said, None of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. They had rejected the invitation, and none of them were to be invited again. In rejecting Christ, the Jews were hardening their hearts and giving themselves into the power of Satan so that it would be impossible for them to accept his grace. So it is now. You see, Ellen White pens it. It was then, and so it is now. If the love of God is not appreciated and does not become an abiding principle to soften and subdue the soul, we are utterly lost. Let me read that again. Sometimes you have to read it over and over to really grasp the true meaning of inspiration. If, and when she uses that word, there's a condition. Condition. If the love of God is not appreciated and does not become an abiding principle. What is this principle? The consistent life. The holy conversation. The integrity. The active benevolent spirit and the godly example. If this principle does not abide in, in the heart, we are utterly lost. The Lord can give no greater manifestation of His love than He has given. If, here she goes again, if, if the love of Jesus does not subdue the heart, there are no means by which we can be reached. This hardened heart has to be broken up as it was when I gave the heart, my heart back to the Lord. My heart was so hardened that it took a miracle to soften this hard heart of mine. Every time, she says, every time you refuse to listen to the message of mercy, you strengthen yourself in unbelief. And what was the problem with the Jews? Unbelief. They didn't believe that he was the Messiah. Christ was the only Savior to them. Christ is the only Savior for us this morning. Every time you fail to open the door of your heart, you become more and more unwilling to listen to the voice of him that speaketh. Do you hear him speak to you every morning? Do you hear him speaking to you in the afternoon? Do you hear him speaking to you in the evening? Do you hear his voice this morning? You diminish your chance of responding to the last appeal of mercy. Let it not be written of you as ancient Israel. Ephraim is joined 
to their idols. This afternoon, we're going to look at these idols that are separating God's people in the church. You know, the book of Isaiah talks about Isaiah. God raised Isaiah for a time to give a message to who? It wasn't to the Gentiles. It was to the people that were the chosen people because they were stiff-necked, hard-headed, and we're no different today. Hard-headed, stiff-necked, and rebellious. You diminish your chance of responding to the last appeal of mercy. Let not Christ weep over you as he wept over Jerusalem, saying, how, how, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her broad under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left you desolate. We are living in a time when the last message of mercy, the last invitation is sounding to the children of men. God is calling you and I to a higher standard, to live a higher principle. That principle is a consistent life this morning. To let our light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I used to sing that song, This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus come, I'm going to let it shine. Join me. Let it shine till Jesus come, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I grew up as a little child singing that song, not knowing that that little light is a light of consistent life. This morning, you heard a simple message that something that you grew up with, but it had a deeper application for us. We used to think that light is Jesus. Yes, that light is Jesus, but it goes deeper than that. This morning, how many of you would like to have a consistent life? Amen, amen. How many of you would like to be an example in your conversation, holy conversation? How about, how about the unswerving integrity, the active benevolent spirit, the godly example? These are the mediums through which light is conveyed to the world. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we, we saw in your word through inspiration and scripture that we ought to let our light so shine. Father, it was just a song that when we grew up, we just saw, sang that song not having what it really means. But this morning we did see it, that we will not, we will not neglect the weightier matters of the law. We don't want to be like the rich young ruler or the, the lawyer, Lord. I said, I've kept all those commandments and then he walked away sadly. We don't want to be in that position, Lord. We want to obey you as you've given us an example in John chapter 17, verse 18. Forgive us for our neglect. Forgive us for our rebellious hearts. Forgive us for our disobedience, whatever it might be that is in contrary to you, well, I pray, Father, that you will remove it from our hearts. Father, we know that we're living in perilous times and God's people are asleep. I pray, Father, that you will awake us in the way of everlasting. I pray for everyone here, Lord, and their extended families. I pray that you will continue to work in each of us this morning. Help us to break that hardened heart of ours that we may be receptive to the speaking of the Holy Spirit, that still small voice that speaks to us every morning. Creating us a clean heart, renew a right spirit within us, 
that we may prepare for what is coming upon this world. For as Ellen White says, a time of trouble such as never was. We don't even understand what that means. Give us understanding this morning, Lord. But more importantly, give us, help us to surrender our hearts to you. For Christ is the only Savior. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for these precious promises that you've given us today. All these things we ask in the precious and holy name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.